Today we embark on the saga of one man. A man with a plan. The person I speak of is Herr Schnitzel Nazi. I DM slash GM myself, so I am fully aware of how annoying we players can be. But no matter how hard I try to take the game seriously, I always just end up making a completely insane or weird character. I might sometimes be that guy, but I really don't care. I just love making interesting or weird characters so much. The character in question this time was in a game of Call of Cthulhu. The game was run by the Tabletop Gaming Club at my university. I was unsure about joining at first, but my best friend here convinced me to join with him. I had been playing D&D for a long time, and while games of that were on offer, I really wanted to play some Call of Cthulhu, and I was extra happy when my friend wanted to join it with me. The GM for the game seemed like a pretty chill guy, and so did everyone else, so I was pretty happy with it overall. I didn't go into the game completely in the dark. I had wanted to play Call of Cthulhu for years, and had learned the system and everything. I had also spent plenty of time listening to the hilarious stories of famous characters, i.e. Old Man Henderson, Bonesy the Sad Clown, etc. I decided to try and make my own character who would out-crazy them all. His name was Herr Schnitzel Nazi, and as you could have guessed, he was a Nazi. But despite what you're thinking, the guy was born in America and was black. He went to college and became a doctor and moved to Germany after medical school. Unfortunately for him, the Nazis got into power, and if you know your history, they weren't fond of black people. Because he couldn't really easily escape, he decided instead to change his name, relocate, and whiteface himself so that he appeared white. If you get the reference, then I respect you. He changed his name to the most German thing that he could think of, which was Schnitzel Nazi. By the time of the war's beginning, Herr Schnitzel Nazi had risen to the rank of Hitler's private doctor. I should also clarify that to further protect himself, he decided to embrace all of the ideologies of the Nazis. Because of this, I was also able to justify that he received military training and had one of those hilarious belt buckle guns that Hitler's private bodyguards had on. Only, he modified it so that it fired after he did a pelvic thrust. After the war, Herr Schnitzel Nazi was captured by the Americans and tried desperately to convince them that he was both black and American. Unfortunately for him, due to the fact that he had been undercover for so long, his accent was so irreversibly German, and the makeup he was using had permanently stained his skin white. As a result, his rather stupid American bodyguards didn't believe him. He spent the next 10 years being experimented on, which made him completely insane as a result. He then very much began to believe in the ideologies of the Nazis, and completely forgot that he was black. After 10 years, he escaped in a lab fire and went to an old Nazi safe house in Germany. There, he acquired everything that he needed and what Hitler had given him to protect. This included an entire arsenal of weapons, including Lugers, Sturmgewehr 44s, MG42s, an honest working Flammenwerfer, and boxes upon boxes of ammunition, stick grenades, and landmines. He also has millions of dollars of Nazi gold and even the original copy of the Mona Lisa. I joked that in this universe the Nazis had the real one and the one in Paris is a fake. He returned to America after smuggling all of his materials inside and using an apartment as a staging ground. Herr Schnitzel Nazi then used decades of time to prepare for the coming of the Fourth Reich. This included keeping the weapons in good condition, training, and keeping himself physically fit. He used his Nazi gold in his day job as a dog groomer to survive and collect more supplies. Just to make it all even funnier, he wears his Nazi SS uniform, which he never takes off for any reason. He's also an alcoholic, and learned to appreciate the wonders of weed. Over his years of stewing in his own madness, he's fully embraced the flat earth and hollow earth ideas. He has also developed rather major phobias of communists, the Battle of Kursk, pirates, books, and spoons. And lastly, 
While he still embraces a Nazi ideology, he can no longer remember who he hates. So, he has decided to blame all his hate and misfortunes on Vietnam and Scientology, despite never having any contact with either. When I brought this character to the session, I honestly thought they were going to make me roll up a new one. But I was pleasantly surprised when the DM told me that he was actually excited to see me roleplay this crazy fucker. But then I got a look at everyone else's characters, and that's when I realized that this was going to be the weirdest campaign I've ever played. The first character was a nine-year-old girl who worshipped mattresses, lived in a mall Sears for most of her life, and was a master at throwing knives. She also roleplayed the girl like a fucking psychopath. The next character was a U.S. Senator named Dick Fister. My thoughts too. The character was role-played like the most stereotypical American patriotic senator you could imagine. Think McCarthy on steroids. Despises anything that isn't capitalism. Death is a preferable alternative to communism. Calls his enemies commies and uses a massive 44 magnum shape to look like a bald eagle, which he named Freedom. After him was the president of the Tabletop Club. He role-played the only sane character in the group. He was an overzealous bodyguard who acted like Dick Fister's security. The only weird thing about him was his name, B.J. Gobbledick. Next was the president's girlfriend, who was, honest to God, the funniest role player I've ever seen. Simp. She played the character Chuck the Lump. This guy was a redneck farmer with an axe and a double-barreled shotgun. He was also indescribably stupid. I could not describe to you how well she role-played his stupidity. It was so good. Lastly was my friend's character, and it was probably the weirdest, second only to mind. Remember Joseph Coney, the African warlord? Yeah, the guy role-played Joseph Coney in all his glory. He role-played him perfectly, and the GM allowed him to have what was probably the funniest ability I've ever seen. It was Summon Child Soldier. This allowed him to summon 1d8 child soldiers under his command, each with an AK-47. They were really weak, but could deal a good amount of damage, and were perfect for covering escapes and working as cannon fodder. So you guys want a highlight reel? Alright, sounds good to me. I have a few more stories, but I think that it's best to start at the very beginning, so let's do that. Our group was supposed to meet at some sort of commune in the vast forest of Montana. I honestly intended for us to start in a large city, hence my apartment filled with an ass ton of weapons. I felt as though it put a damper on my playstyle, but I decided to roll with the punches. I asked the GM if I could, instead of my apartment, keep my entire arsenal and personal wealth in my car instead. Him, being the cool guy he is, said sure. The car that I chose for Herr Schnitzel Nazi was a Pinto Cruising Wagon, an absolutely hideous car that I felt fitted his character. I would also later learn that the car's major defect is that it would often explode on its own if it got into a crash, particularly particularly, particularly, if it was rear-ended. Anyways, while Coney was hitching a ride with the trucker to get to the commune, the nine-year-old girl Mackenzie was riding up in Chuck's rusty old pickup truck, and Senator Fister and Gobbledick were arriving by helicopter. I, in full SS attire, drove right up, keeping a Sturmgewehr, Luger, and a single stick grenade, Stelgranat, and my trusty belt buckle gun on me. Welcome, friends. I'm Director Nathan, said some guy dressed in a white jumpsuit who was waiting for us at the gates. I'm assuming we all arrived at the same time for dramatic timing. This guy starts telling us the history of this town, something about how an environmentally aware company helped them set up, and how this community was completely green and completely self-sufficient. My Nazi senses were immediately tingling, and I didn't trust these guys. My character was insane in 92 at this point in his life, so I decided to start old manning the shit out of this. I started going on a classic old man rant, 
Only I'm also talking about how I thought they were communist hippie Viet Cong. I threw a lot of Pepperidge Farm references in there as well, and started talking about the good old days of Nazi Germany. In game, everyone is just staring at me, until eventually the senator cuts me off. Ignore this fascist fuck bucket, he says. I'm looking to help get the votes from your crowd, and I understand they love all this useless hippie stuff. We all go on talking to director Nathan for a while, till eventually he asks us to fix some power chip that keeps the water purifier running. Is this a Fallout reference? And how if we don't fix it, then no more clean water. Insert Fallout joke here. Okay. And we head off. I have a high drive skill, which I justify by saying that I drove Hitler's staff car, but Gobbledick decides that he wants to drive instead. Me being crazy, I immediately whip out the grenade and immediately start accusing Gobbledick of being a Scientologist. They all freak out a little and they insist on confiscating the grenade. I half-heartedly agree, but promise that I will have it back. Out of game, Gobbledick turned to me and said, Isn't this grenade like 70 years old? I nod, and he starts laughing. He told me that he's played with the GM before, and he's the kind of guy who might make the grenade go off on his belt if he were in the mood. So, without anyone else knowing, he hands the grenade back to me. So after wrecking two of the jeeps we were supposed to take to the water plant, the GM says that we see a windowless white van pull up to us. Coney immediately puts McKenzie out of view, because we were all thinking exactly the same thing. The driver seems like a normal guy and introduces himself as Phil. We tell him we need to get to the water purifier, but he just laughs and says that he fixed it this morning. He then invites us to go with him to take care of some compost at a plant that will pack it as fertilizer. Seeing nothing else to do, we go with him. The job basically required the stronger people in the party, which basically left everyone but me and Mackenzie. Mackenzie, being the little girl she is, says she holds the door. I, on the other hand, start feeling my Nazi senses tingling again, so I decide to investigate. I head outside the plant, slipping away before anyone can notice me leaving. I start sneaking around the building when suddenly I hear something just beyond the corner. I roll for a stealth check but just barely don't make it. The GM says that I hear a low growl and something scraping along the wall just around the corner from me. I decide to go into battle mode. I pull the pin on my grenade and yell, Surprise, cockbag! From the other's point of view, they're just working away, when suddenly they hear a deafening explosion along the outside of the wall, which causes massive structural damage in the form of a huge dent and in turn knocks over some of the heavy machinery right on to poor Phil, who gets pinned under. Eh, I mean, steel grenades were a concussion grenade. No, I don't think so, Chief, but whatever. While the others rush out guns drawn, I'm standing there holding the pieces of what looked like a hairless rodent of unusual size, the R.O.U.S.'s, by what's left of its tail. When the others get to me, I hold them up at Luger Point and say, I killed it. I get to eat it. After much arguing and debating and ignoring poor Phil, we head back to the plant and notice that everyone is gone. Phil from under his machinery and all of the other workers. Cars are all still there, but no people. All that's left was a mysterious green goo. Chuck decides that he wants to eat it, but fortunately Coney convinces him otherwise. After some debate, we decide to go on a manhunt for the others, because apparently the others haven't seen a horror movie in their entire life. While we search the rest of the building, Coney decided that now was the time to use his once per day child soldier ability. <laughs> okay. He ordered them to patrol the farm fields just outside the building and look for anything of note. Chuck, despite being a complete moron, is actually the only one of us with any experience around farming equipment and proves to be of some use. Particularly when we find a tractor in a barn not too far away. This guy says particularly a fucking a lot and I hate it. Ah. Just after we found it, we heard screaming in the fields and gunfire as well. Meaning that the kids clearly found something they didn't like. 
Gobbledick wanted to go help them, or at least find out what's been doing this, but Senator Fister, Coney, and I agree that, meh, they're just children. Strangely, so did Mackenzie. We all get back in the van that we took here, and Mackenzie hotwires it. The kid hotwires it? Fucking wacked. This time I drive, and we head back to the commune. We get about halfway there before meeting with some other guys in white jumpsuits. Only... They're also wearing bulletproof vests and carrying assault rifles. So we stop the car and I roll down the window to speak to them. Well, hi there, sugar. What brings y'all out here in this time of night, baby? I say in my best southern bell voice. I have absolutely no idea why I did this. I think I just thought that it was something ridiculous and in character. If you're having a hard time imagining this... Just imagine an ancient man wearing a Nazi SS uniform talking like that. After some more talking, the guards eventually agree to escort us back to the compound because we insist on speaking to a director after seeing what we saw. We get back and this time find an entirely new guy waiting for us. And now the guards are calling him Director Scott. Where the fuck is the last man? Coney asked. I thought Mr. Nathan was the director. I'd like to stop and say that my friend, Hasconi, had spent a year in Uganda helping out the people there. Because of that, he was doing a near flawless Ugandan accent and everything. <laughs> what the fuck is the last man? Director Scott informs us that there never was a director Nathan. The only Nathan in the commune is a sanitation worker. Senator Fister starts going on about how sneaky poor people are after that. We're all left really confused at this point, because we mentioned Director Nathan to Phil back when he was alive and he seemed to be totally aware of Director Nathan. We would have questioned this further, but we liked Director Scott, so we didn't give a shit. By this point, it was around 10 at night. Director Scott tells us that we should be getting to sleep and then gives us a cryptic warning about how we should, under no circumstances, go outside at night. A bit unnerved further, we decide to head over to where we'd be living, with each of us piling in mine and Chuck's cars to get there. Our living quarters was an honest-to-god log cabin. Only by log cabin, it was massive. Two stories and more than enough room for all of us to live there. I want to unpack all of my stuff into the cabin, but when I go to the door to try and open it to get into my car, I notice that a sort of electronic lock has been activated, preventing me from opening the thick door. I try my key, but it doesn't work either. We all wanted to give a shit, but none of us really could. I decide to sleep on the couch in the living room for the night while the others turn in. I don't really know why I did it, I think I just wanted someone to survive in case the rooms are wired with explosives or killer robots or Shagoth or something. The GM tells me that we all wake up around 2am to a really loud and obnoxious sound that seems to be coming from the entry hallway. I, being the closest, get up and investigate. It's the electric door lock. It suddenly unlocked itself. Before I can really do anything, the GM tells Gobbledick, <laughs> Gobbledick, goddammit, the GM tells Gobbledick, who's sleeping on the second floor right next to Senator Fister, that he hears slow and steady walking along the roof of his house, right above his room, and it's slowly headed for his window, which also has had its electric lock disabled. Without hesitation, he gets out his gun and points it at the window. He sees the silhouette of a vaguely humanoid figure covered in spikes crawling down the wall, looking in through the window, reaching a clawed hand to open it. Three shots each hitting the fucker later, it falls a full story down as dead as can be. We all hear the gunshots at this point. I grab my trusty Sturmgewehr 44 and Coney is effing foul. 762 real fucking NATO. Mackenzie grabs her throwing knives and Chuck his shotgun and axe. Meanwhile, Senator Fister is busy pushing his furniture up against his window and door. <laughs> the GM says that we can hear inhuman screaming from all around us. Dozens of separate voices. 
It's at this moment that I wish that I had been able to unpack my car. Everyone rushes into the living room. Chuck, Coney, and Gobbledick are all barricading entrances. While Mackenzie had somehow used her superb climbing skill to climb to the top of the chandelier hanging over the middle of the room. I, on the other hand, went to the bar and started downing a fifth of whiskey. If I was going to die, it wouldn't be sober. The living room of this cottage was quite large, and the back wall was almost entirely a single window which overlooked a lake, about 200 feet away from us. This will come up later. To make a long battle short, the fuckers came at us from every direction and we kept on gunning them down. After each of us losing probably half of our hit points a person, and with over a dozen of the fuckers dead, we finally felt as though we had won. I immediately took this opportunity and ran to my car. I threw open the trunk door and grabbed a Panzer Shrek, a few rockets, and one of my stick grenade boxes. Herr Schnitzel Nazi always carries around at least a thousand rounds of ammo with him, so I was fine on that front. While I was doing this, shit was going down in the cabin. The others noticed a massive, monstrous being that started coming out of the lake. Something so strange that you had to roll a sanity check just to keep from going mad when you saw it. Most everyone passed the check, except for poor Chuck and Senator Fister, who had rejoined the group. I just got back when this thing came out. Chuck and Senator Fister immediately started walking towards it as if they were in a trance. Desperate to protect his senator, Gobbledick restrained him from walking to the beast in the lake. Unfortunately for Chuck, no one was strong enough to stop him from getting there. So I decided to do the next best thing. Suicide bomber mode. Gobbledick had knocked Senator Fister unconscious, and while the rest of the party was doing everything they could to stall Chuck, I grabbed some twine, which the GM said I had hundreds of feet of in the kitchen. Why? I have no idea. I tied the twine to the ends of each grenade and started placing them everywhere on Chuck. When he had about 20 grenades tied to him, <laughs> we let him walk to the beast at the edge of the lake. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I thought that um, Herr Schnitzel was going to be a suicide bomber. Nope, he, uh, he volunteered Chuck. Motherfucker. <laughs> I kept the ends just loose enough so that I wouldn't pull the pins early, but just taut enough so that I could pull them with ease. Just when Chuck reached the creature and it got close enough to him, I pulled back the strings. I could not have wished for a bigger explosion. Chuck blew up right next to the thing and practically half the fucker was gone. The GM said that it wasn't dead yet though and was just sort of pathetically trying to slink its way back into the water. Without hesitation, I loaded my Panzer Shrek and blew the fucker to pieces. But not before saying, you're the ugliest fucking trout I've ever seen. For whatever it could do, it couldn't survive getting hit with an anti-tank weapon. That concluded our first session. Of the other big tales, which I will tell another time, there are the following. The pig roast, the incident with the boats, the toilet hand, fire and blood, and the grand finale, killing the gods. This story took place probably about four gaming sessions deep into our campaign. By this point, we had discovered that the commune was run by an assiduous cult who had been luring people to it for the past 20 years and either to brainwash them to join its ranks or turn them into what they called the Brethren. We had plenty of experience with the Brethren, though. We killed almost two dozen of them at our cabin. Basically, the cult thought that at some point we had seen too much too early. So they decided brainwashing us was a lost cause. So they just decided to let the brethren eat us. At this point though, it still left us wondering what that thing in the lake was. Emphasis on was, thanks to Herr Schnitzel Nazi. After the battle at our cabin, we sensed something was wrong with the commune immediately. Nazi senses were tingling once again, you could say. 
We were all worried, so we decided to play a hunch and have Mackenzie sneak into what was essentially the commune's prison, so that she could talk to the people that were held prisoner there. Now, you might be asking, why we trust a nine-year-old with this mission? And it was simultaneously because she was the stealthiest, and we all didn't give a shit. Mackenzie found all of this information out from the prisoners, namely Phil, who she found in one of the cells. Phil was already in the process of transforming into one of the brethren, but with what little sanity he had left, he told Mackenzie everything. He also begged her to kill him, which she did. Now, when I say that she did it, I mean she did it immediately. Right after he said the words, her knife was out and in his throat. No hesitation or anything. To make things even more psychopathic, she then went on a killing rampage in the prison, killing all the inmates to prevent them from being turned. Some of them were quite thankful for it, yes. But we also learned from the GM that some of the people she killed had absolutely no idea about what happens with the commune and were only in there for minor infractions. Mackenzie really didn't care when she found out metagame style either. So, after we found this out, we decided to make a break for it, because we knew they'd try to finish the job. Insert one session of us basically setting as many buildings on fire as we could to distract them, and we made our escape in Chuck's old truck, and my Pinto cruising wagon. And, also as a middle finger, I set up every single landmine that I had along the only entrance and exit from the main area of the commune. So, to make a long story short, we eventually found a summer camp that was kind of like a co-ed version of the Boy Scouts. The camp counselors didn't like us being there, but one intimidate check from Coney and I later and they basically gave us full control of the camp. The president of the club's girlfriend, the one who played Chuck earlier, also ended up playing as Buddy, one of the camp counselors. He was a big dude with a full, thick, and bushy survivalist beard, and a demeanor that reminded me of someone who was stoned off their ass. Only it was all the time. So that basically brings you up to speed. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by Neckbeardia's 3D Printed Models. Go ahead and check out the eBay store down below. We have tons and tons of really cool looking models. We've got it all from orcs, dwarves, the lizards and fish people. And yes, most of the sets you can get some big bitty bitches in with them. <laughs> and honestly, they're our biggest sellers. Yeah, by far. Yeah. All the models are printed and processed by us and it is by far the best way to help us out to do what we do. So go ahead and check them out below and just just look at this lizard lady with titties. She got big titties. <laughs> look at the titties! <laughs> By this point, we knew that we couldn't stay at this camp for long. Partially because it was on the other side of the lake from the cultist commune. So we could literally see where we once were. The beginning of the session really consisted of us trying to come up with a plan of action for our characters. How we could uncover more information on how we could stop whatever the cult was planning. All while the eldritch horrors have been harassing us and the kids. Don't worry too much about the kids though. Coney made sure to start training them as fervently loyal child soldiers. So we were better protected. Who will think of the children? I will think of the children. Left, right, yo, right, yo, right. We got our first lead the second night we stayed at the camp. I should clarify that this wasn't like a campsite or anything where everything was set up when we got there. It was like a camp that had been built years ago and had clearly been running for years. This meant structures like cabins, a mess hall, medical center, ranges, places to earn various merit badges, and of course the bathrooms. I believe that it was Senator Fister who decided to go to the bathroom, with Gobbledick waiting outside for him. I decided that my character also had to use the bathroom, so I went in there as well. Unfortunately, there were only toilets and no urinals. Herr Schnitzel Nazi refused to use toilets if he only had to pee, so instead, he went to piss in the sink. I think it was when I heard screaming coming from one of the toilets that we first realized that something weird was happening. 
Before I could even react, Gobbledick threw the door open and kicked in the door of Senator Dick Fisser's bathroom stall and tackling him mid-shit. Nothing was happening to him, however, because the screaming was coming from one of the younger children who was in the stall next to Senator Fister. While Fister was cursing out his security guard, I kicked open the other stall, only to watch what was left of the kid being dragged down the tiny hole of the toilet, leaving a bloody mess there. Three sanity checks passed later, and we were ready to act. We knew that the kid had to be dead. He was already small, even for his age. But to pull a kid through the hole meant that a couple of things needed to have been bent and broken. Before we could tell the others, another unnaturally long hand shot out of the toilet and grabbed Gobbledick by the throat, using immense strength to pull him head first into the toilet. That got us into a game of tug of war with Gobbledick's body, which we were rapidly losing. It was all we could do just to keep his head out of the water. When it became apparent that we were going to lose, I pulled out a combat knife that I kept on me and slashed away at the arm. Now, Herr Schnitzel Nazi, as a 92-year-old man, is weak as fuck, but he still did enough damage for the toilet hand to decide that it wasn't worth it, so it slunk back into the toilet. We ran out of there to tell the others, and we decided this would be our best lead. But how could we follow the toilet hand? After stealing a uniform from a camper, I took out a hyper-realistic blow-up doll that I had in my cruising wagon and put the uniform on her. <laughs> I took out a hyper-realistic blow-up doll that I had in my cruising wagon for some unknown reason and put the uniform on her. <laughs> I'm... I made out with my blow-up doll Helga one last time before strapping half a cart of grenades to her and rigging the pins to be pulled when she got about halfway down the toilet. It's like a scene from fucking Tremors. I think the GM was getting tired of my car of crazy at that point right there. Half the toilets blew up and we heard a high-pitched monstrous scream come from inside. When we went in to survey the damage, we found that there was actually a massive gaping hole that led to the underground underneath the toilet. Buddy the camp counselor decided that he wanted to take point, and pulled out a 44 Magnum and a flashlight and jumped down the hole. A tunnel rat right after my own heart. Apparently he had the Magnum in case of bear attacks. We all followed him and found that this hole was recently carved. Imagine a cave, the sort that kind of snakes along for miles. That was basically what we were dealing with. Now, Herr Schnitzel Nazi was coming prepared this time. Now I had five grenades on me, and a Flammenwerfer for all with me. Figured the MG-42 was too big and heavy for my feeble old man to carry on his own. We went on for a long while, with the cave kind of going on a downward angle. We also noticed things starting to get really wet, so we figured that we were underneath the lake at this point. Eventually, we came across a massive cistern, complete with stonework and statues of monstrous beings, but nobody was around. We saw writing along the walls, written in some kind of ancient alien language, that we didn't bother taking a tracing of or anything. Figured it wasn't worth much. The cistern had about seven other paths snicking off in all different directions, so we spent the next five minutes trying to decide where to go next. That's when the Shagoth came. I'm assuming the Shagoth was the toilet hand here. It just sort of rose out of a massive basin filled with water, tentacles everywhere like a Japanese hentai. To make matters worse, about half a dozen of the brethren came to help it in the combat. Gobbledick and Mackenzie were both dragged off to die during the fight, and Coney used his summon child soldier ability again, which did help. I was desperately using my Flammenwerther on the Shagoth, but every time I caught part of it on fire, it would just move that part back into the water and extinguish it, not really dealing much damage. I knew that we needed something big to kill the Shogoth, and every time we killed enough of the brethren to focus fire on the fucker, more would just come. GM, you are a sadistic bastard. 
I ran up the stairs to the third level, where I noticed a particularly large stone statue of what I think was the monstrous creature we saw come out of the lake that first game. Deciding it was big enough, I went right for it. I think the GM didn't want me to have it be quite so easy, so he had one of the brethren crawl its way right along the wall right towards me. Herr Schnitzel Nazi just shouted at the thing. Spider-Man, is that really you? As if he were a Starstruck fan. Spider-Man, is that really you? <laughs> Needless to say, the brethren was not amused and tackled me. Unfortunately for it, I pumped a couple shots into it for my be oh humped never mind I humped a couple pu <laughs> God damn it Unfortunately for it I humped a couple of shots into it for my belt buckle gun Bet you forgot about that into where I think his dick used to be With that out of the way I went up behind the statue and started dousing it in flames Now stone doesn't burn but fire does weaken its structure and because the Nazis were just oh so smart as to put tar into the mix of their flamethrowers so that the flames stick to whatever they hit, the fire was all around the statue. That's when I rolled to throw all of my grenades at the statue and have them get caught right behind it and the wall. It should blow it straight off. One critical success later and the statue went off just as planned. It actually fell before I could throw all of my grenades, leaving me with one left again. I don't think I could have asked for a better shot. The statue landed right on top of the Shogoth and it just went squish. The rest of the brethren were easy enough to clean up after that. We were left with just the Senator, Coney, Buddy, and myself. We weren't quite done with the session though. The remainder of us decided to go down the path which was the only one made of stone. Do you remember those scenes in Harry Potter where they're in the Ministry of Magic with those black stone blocks? That was essentially what the tunnel was made of. After a few hundred feet of walking, we came to a large room which looked like an old study. There were shelves upon shelves of ancient looking books and a single large desk in the middle of the room with papers and drawings of occult symbols and rituals all over it. Without hesitation, Buddy the camp counselor pulled out a massive bag of weed. Coney, Buddy, and I all took pieces of paper from the desk and rolled them in the joints, which we all started smoking. Senator Fister, however, refused to have any of the devil's cabbage. After getting stoned off of some good herb, we all began to stupidly look around at some of the books. As we were doing that, a group of some of the cultists from the commune came down to try and find out where all the noise down here was. Buddy, Coney, Senator Fister, and Coney's one remaining child soldier heard them coming, and all readied themselves to fire down the hallway. Herr Schnitzel Nazi, on the other hand, was way too baked and decided that reading was better worth his time. What the fuck do all these words mean, you cocksuckers? I asked before reading a mangled version of one of the summoning rituals. When I did this, I accidentally summoned an eldritch demon of sorts, which manifested before us, right out of the smoke from the weed. I almost forgot to mention, there was so much smoke from the pot that the entire hallway was basically covered in the stuff, drastically reducing visibility. It was damned convenient for us, because my demon just ran straight down the hallway and all we heard at the other end were a few gunshots and screams. When it was all cleared, we found the remains of what I think were at one point five separate people. Difference was that they had been... spread. In celebration of a job well done, Coney and Fister decided to take some of the books with us, while Buddy and I lit up again. This also caused me to inadvertently set the study on fire. Damned convenient, once again. And thus concludes the toilet hand. Coming up next in the adventures of Herr Schnitzel Nazi is Fire and Blood. Will we succeed? Find out the next exciting poke. So this fantastic story of Fire and Blood was a session right after our last adventure, which saves us most of a recap. However, something did take place outside of the game. We play the game every Sunday. We have a group chat where we can coordinate, talk, and share the occasional meme with one another. 
In this group chat, probably around Thursday or something, I posted that I didn't think the GM was capable of killing off Herr Schnitzel Nazi. What are you gonna do? Stab me? Man, he was stabbed. I'm taking that as a challenge, was all he said in response. After that, I knew that I'd done fucked up. So I had to mentally prepare myself for the session, because the GM's words and some sort of sixth sense told me that if I wasn't careful, Herr Schnitzel Nazi would die this session. My Nazi senses were tingling, if you would. The session began with us back in the summer camp. The girl who played Mackenzie decided to take one of the other campers as a character. This one was a girl named Susie who was unusually good with the rifle and was basically our assassin. The president, Gobbledick's old player, decided that he was going to be a hobo named Hobo Joe that we found in Through the Woods. Joe was a rather interesting character who was predominantly a melee character and armed with a fire axe, two combat knives, knives? Two combat knives and was quite good at making and throwing Molotov cocktails. Anyways, back to the story, our gang of misfits started looking through some of the old books and writings that we stole and couldn't make heads or tails of anything, because none of us had any skill with the occult. So, we decided to head into a fairly large town that was only a few miles away. Before we drove there, Buddy discovered that one of the other camp counselors was in fact an imposter. After a brief session of interrogation, we discovered that the guy was a member of the cult and had been spying on us for a while. He laughed in our faces when he said that he already sent word to the cult and that they'd never stop hunting us. Coney then decided that he wanted to give the children a fun activity. So we ordered them all to get knives, forks, stakes, sharpened sticks, or anything like that and had them gather in the main gathering section. We then tossed them the cultus, bound and gagged, and told the children to have fun. According to the GM, after a week of being told violence and murder is okay and receiving Coney's valuable training, the children swarmed the cultus like a band of angry sharks. Coney was so proud of the kids that the merciless slaughter brought a tear to his eye. We need that picture of Mushu going, my little baby, off to destroy people? That'd be uh, very fitting this particular occasion, I think. So after scarring over a hundred children, scarring, I prefer the term hardening, but that's just me. So after hardening over a hundred children to the illustrious allure of bloodlust and battle, we decided to leave to go to the town where Hobo Joe knew of a professor of the occult lived. At this point, we still had my Pinto cruising wagon and Chuck's van. Remember that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by THE FURRY HUNTER CLASS! <laughs> it's a class dedicated to slaying the furry menace that infests the land of Neckbeardia. And yeah, if you haven't noticed, it's a party of Matt Mercer of Critical Role's Blood Hunter. It's a solid shitpost put together by us and a few of the DMs on the West March server. It's a great way to help us, and for the low low price of just one pound, it's hard to go wrong with the PDF. But enough of the Blood Hunter, let's get back to the video. We arrived in the town and immediately got to work trying to find the professor, who Hobo Joe had met in a Costco. As you could imagine, this wasn't easy, particularly when one of the people asking was dressed like an African warlord and another in full SS attire. Eventually, we got a lead where a local bar owner said the professor frequented every night with his wife. That's when we decided to stake it out. Unfortunately for us, we didn't see the professor until the cultists arrived. We didn't notice them at first. They weren't dressed in the white jumpsuits like earlier. They wore normal civilian clothes. We watched them from our cars as they pulled a dazed elderly couple out of a bar, each with what appeared to be head wounds. We ran out of our cars to try and help them, but before we could, two of the men pulled out assault rifles and fired on us. I and Senator Fister took a couple of shots, but overall we were alright. Our party was pretty heavily fucking armed after all. We took the professor and his wife and set them in our cars. After all the stuff we've seen, we all agreed that driving back to the camp alone at night was way too risky. So we rented out a hotel rooms a few blocks down. It was a rather stressful experience, even inside of the hotel. 
We kept looking out of the windows and noticing the same few cars constantly driving by, and a group of people were staring at us all night. Didn't exactly need to jump to too many conclusions to assume that the cultists had surrounded us. We gave the professor and his wife some over-the-counter painkillers to help them concentrate, and eventually they came out of their dazed state. When the professor woke us up and saw that we were most certainly not his would-be captors, he was so thankful that he was willing to help us in any way possible. We showed him the texts and drawings from the book that we stole, and he said that he recognized them in some of the artistry and stories from some of the local Native Americans. Additionally, he could roughly translate some of our texts. He said that they were prophecies in historic... historic... Esoteric ramblings. God, I hate being a fucking redneck sometimes. <sighs> he said that they were prophecies and esoteric ramblings about something only referred to as the God in the Lake and about how he requires servants. So after telling the professor about the cult to this God in the Lake and how they'll do anything in their power to kill him because he's the only one within the hundreds of miles who could help us stop them, he seemed to go into a rather worried state. Clearly the lazy shit has never had people try to kill him before. We spent the entire night on watch for the cultist. We figured that even they wouldn't dare risk exposure unless they absolutely had to, and we were completely right. It was around 8 a.m. before anyone else got up when I was watching the cultist. I decided to act in the schnitzel Nazi way because we needed a way through. I headed down to the parking garage where my car was and got out every stick grenade I could carry, as well as another Panzer Shrek and four rockets. I also took out extra Luger and Sturmgewehr 44 ammo with me, because I figured that after last time, the GM would want that car and all of its goodies destroyed, and I needed to stock up. The parking garage had two exits to it, and thanks to my recon, I noticed that the cultists were patrolling both of them. Just as damned good soldiers of the Third Reich would, Herr Schnitzel Nazi said aloud. I went to the north exit, which was larger and had a few more cultists guarding it. Figured that if I was going to do this, I'd do it where the most cultists were. Four rockets later, I had successfully obliterated their cars, all but one of their members, and severely damaged the road, making it nigh useless. I put the weapon back in the car, and immediately ramped my hotel room, where staff and guests were clearly freaking the fuck out about the four missiles that just went off outside, exactly as planned. Evil. <laughs> Schnitzel Nazi hands rubbed together excitedly. I threw open the door to our room and yelled at everyone to get going immediately, because the cultist cars just suddenly exploded for some reason. We all reached our cars, and I specifically told Buddy, the driver of Chuck's old truck, that he was to follow me no matter what I did. When I got into the car, I gave one of my Panzerfaust to Susie, who was riding shotgun. I told her that if there's anything blocking our way, she was to shoot it. Gave her the Panzerfaust because the young thing couldn't handle the full Panzer Shrek, and damn if I didn't have the little psychopath's best interest at heart. I had correctly assumed that the police, EMTs, fire trucks, and debris clearing department, whatever they're called, would have blocked off the road so that they could clear it, which meant that the cultists assumed that our only way out was the south exit, meaning they were waiting for us to come out there and not the north, because clearly no one would be crazy enough to go out of the north lot now. My evil plan had succeeded. Somehow, both Buddy and I passed our driving checks to get past a really fucked up road, burning wrecks of cars and police vehicles. Susie really only had to fire the Panzerfaust once. We made it, we thought. Unfortunately for us, the GM wasn't going to have us win that easily. One of the cultists had seen us leaving from across the street and immediately set out in pursuit. One fired an RPG and hit Chuck's truck behind us which immediately did a flip and crashed. Now, the professor and his wife were in that car, so we figured we couldn't leave them. Who also cares about allies anyway? I stopped my Pinto cruising wagon and I, Coney, Hobo Joe, and Susie got out guns blazing and ready. 
We examined the other car and found that the professor, his wife, and Senator Fister had all miraculously survived. I'll bet at really low HP. Unfortunately, Buddy had died on impact. I stealthily swiped the massive bag of weed he kept on himself because I'd be damned if I let those cultists enjoy it. The cultists all pulled up their cars around us and got out, guns drawn, ready to kill. One of their priests approached us and offered us mercy if we surrendered then and there because he admired our tenacity. Simultaneously seeing where that was going and having my Nazi senses tingling, I immediately... <laughs> you could play a fucking drinking game with these stories, but how many times this guy types out immediately? I immediately pulled out the pins on two of my grenades and yelled back, Screw you, nerds! and throwing it at them with an excellent roll to boot. The survivors all crammed themselves into my car and we drove off. I personally think that it was thanks to my obscenely high luck score, but we somehow avoided all bullet fire. We drove down to the downtown area, desperate to lose them, and eventually we heard what sounded like the same inhuman screaming coming from the forest around the town that we heard when the brethren attacked us, as well as the sounds of something bigger. We looked around us and found that brethren and cultists were all attacking the populace, driving off civilians and of course just killing them, leading to civil panic. We also noticed that an absolutely massive eldritch horror had come into the town and was in hot pursuit of us. Ignoring traffic and telling Coney and Susie to shoot everything they had at it, we were only just managing to stay away from it, but clearly wanted us to die way too much. I think it was at that moment when one of the cultist priests put a curse on my car, which caused me to immediately lose control and ran right into a bar. Immediately. I'm getting a shot, fuck it. <sniffs> Unfortunately, Susie died on impact because she wasn't wearing her booster seat, I guess. Apparently, you're supposed to make children wear seat belts. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? The professor's wife also hadn't taken the impact well and was currently in the process of dying. While I let Coney, Fister, and Hobo Joe deal with all that, I immediately- Up, oh, up, oh, you said immediately again, time to- hold on. Ugh. I immediately ran into the bar and proceeded to smash every bottle I could and start setting the place on fire. The giant monster was right outside, along with about half a dozen fucking brethren who were in the process of rushing us, and a group of cultists was standing outside, assault rifles in hand. One of the brethren attacked me, but thanks to a good dexterity roll, I was able to sort of roll it over me and ride into a pile of broken glass and fire. Speaking of which, apparently bars burned down really well, because the place was a fucking inferno by the time we were about halfway done in dealing with the brethren. By then, though, Senator Fister had passed out due to the sheer panic of the situation, failed Sandy Roll, and fell into some flames. Unfortunate, but one shouldn't cry over an incinerated senator. What the fire did do was give the big bad monster a deterrent from reaching into the place to devour and or crush us to death. Damned convenient, I thought. So, because he couldn't do this, the GM decided to kill another bird, so to speak. The GM pretty much wanted my car dead from the very first time I fired a Panzer Shrek. So he had the monster lean down and take a massive bite out of its back in order to begin the process of swallowing it whole. But the GM had forgotten something. I may have mentioned this earlier, but the reason why Pinto cruising wagons were so unpopular was not just because of the fact that they're absolutely hideous looking. I discovered rather recently that it was also because they had a tendency to explode rather violently if a large amount of force were directed towards the rear of the car, such as if it were rear-ended, or if some, oh I don't know, giant monster were to take an enormous bite out of it. And because my car was already filled to the brim with grenades, rockets, and other such things, the explosion would have been enough to level half of a city block if it were on the ground when it blew up, as opposed to right by what I assume was the monster's face. 
The look on GM's face was priceless when he found this out, but he couldn't do anything about it. And due to the absolutely massive amount of damage dealt to the giant monster, it died immediately. Immediately. Time for a shot. <coughs> Fuck. This event caused so much shock and awe in the cultists that it gave me the perfect opportunity to instead take charge of things going on here. Coney and I shot dead three or four of the cultists across the street. Hobo Joe restrained them. Those fuckers took my Pinto cruising wagon, the thing fitted with what the Fuhrer himself had directly asked Herr Schnitzel Nazi to keep safe. Just to clarify that I am once again role playing here. The GM didn't even make me roll for an intimidate check, which was good because my score was abysmal there. Apparently I am so full of rage that the cultists couldn't help but tell me what I want to know. I demanded to know where that fucking priest was who made me lose control of my goddamned car was. The others in the party immediately up up to for another shot now. <coughs> <coughs> oh my god. It's 10.30 in the morning. What am I doing this? The others in the party immediately <coughs> immediately didn't know what I was doing, but I'd be damned if I was going to let that bastard get away with it. Escape didn't matter to me anymore. This was personal. The cultist didn't know, but he did have the phone number of the priest. After thanking him and ordering Hobo Joe to murder him in whatever way seemed fit to a deranged hobo, I took the phone and impersonated the cultist. I bluffed that the enemies, us, were trying to hunt him down so that he couldn't put any more curses on their cars as they tried to escape. He then told me that he was hiding out at a certain gas station within the city, and he ordered us to retreat to defend him and gave us his location. 4D Nazi chess intensifies. I told Coney and the others that this was our only hope of killing the cultist priest, and with him dead we might be able to put a huge damper on whatever the fuckers were planning. I told them that they should attack the guy from the front while I went in from the rear. They went along with it and I stole some guy's bike from a bike rack and went off. In truth, I was lying to them as well. I wasn't going to attack from the rear. No, that fucker is responsible for my car's fiery and glorious destruction. He doesn't deserve to simply be gunned down. I had to kill him with fire and blood. I started sending private messages to the GM telling him my plan in secret, and at this point I think he actually wanted me to do this. So as Coney, Hobo Joe, and the Professor, who was in a murderous state at the loss of his wife at this point, played out their attack on the gas station, I rode the bike over to an airfield that I saw on our way into town. I went over and found the largest helicopter that I could, judo kicking the pilot who was trying to flee at this point away from it. After, after hot wiring it, I started to fly it to where the, my GPS told me the gas station was. Fortunately, I actually had pilot as a skill. I will never forget the looks on everyone's face when the GM said, through the hail of gunfire and violence, you hear the unmistakable sound of a large helicopter approaching. As you look up, you notice that it appears to be heading for a direct impact for the gas station. As realizations suddenly dawn on players and the cultists alike, I jumped from the helicopter after with my parachute, after securing the shaft so that it could not avoid hitting the gas station directly. Thing about gas stations is that when they explode, they explode big. Everyone around it was probably vaporized if I had to guess. Now I personally thought that I needed to distract the cultists, otherwise they might have seen the helicopter coming too early and escaped. But I also honestly thought that the others wouldn't have been so close and would have been outside of the radius of the explosives. Or that is that maybe I forgot to tell them? I was also surprised when none of them were really mad at me, even though I killed all of them and the professor. I guess they thought it was a hilarious way to go. So the game ended as I stood at the top of the building surveying the wreckage. Though fire and blood was wrought, I was the lone survivor of the party. Was it worth it? Fuck yeah it was. We last left off the game with me being the only surviving party member and no one within the state we were in who could translate the text that we needed. 
We were two children, a camp counselor, a senator, his bodyguard, a mentally challenged redneck, a hobo, and an African warlord down. And I needed to fill my ranks once again so I could continue my crusade. You see, with the destruction of his car, the cultists made this battle personal. And he wasn't going to stop until every single one of them Scientologist commie motherfuckers was dead. My first step was to roam the ruins of the town and look for suitable survivors who would be willing to assist me in my crusade. Wasn't too easy, as most of the town's populace was either killed, ran away, or rendered irreversibly insane in the battle between us and the cult slash monsters. The GM had all the other players start rolling up characters who would act as survivors in the town. The president of the Tabletop Club, aka Gobbledick and Hobo Joe's player, made a character named Sergeant Jackson, a marine whose tour of duty recently ended and lost his wife in the recent battle. The president's girlfriend, aka Chuck and Buddy the camp counselor's player, who for some reason would only play as male characters, but hey, I don't judge, made the character Josephi, the mustached Eastern European man whose smoothie store was destroyed in the battle. She described him as a short and broad-shouldered man with a mustache that would make Mario and Joseph Stalin blush. The girl who played both of the child characters decided to mix things up here, and this time play as a teenage girl. This was Tiffany Goldstein, a 16-year-old girl whose boyfriend and entire family were killed at the gas station. She fortunately didn't know that it was Herr Schnitzel Nazi who flew the plane. Senator Fister's next character was Wolf Staggs, a hardcore survivalist who just happened to be in town when it was attacked, and who was also staying in the hotel that we were at, which apparently caught fire not long after the battle started. And then there's Coney's character, my best friend at my university. I had no idea what he was going to do, and so when we were walking to the meeting place together, I asked the guy and what he told me, I had to admit, was pretty fucking good. He was playing as Jason Knight, a ghost hunter. He was a man who ran one of those ghost hunting TV shows, so he always had his camera on him. He filmed the entirety of the battle and wanted to head out with me for the views. So, on with the adventure. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to talk to you about our new affiliate, Reroll. Reroll is a D&D 5th edition character builder app. Now, everyone needs a character sheet app for a tabletop game, but what makes Reroll stand out above all the rest is its character art. I personally find the character art really, really cool. It has this beautiful retro pixel art aesthetic and they are continually adding new races and items so you can customise it whatever way you want. They currently have 14 supported races, over 150 weapons and over 400 pieces of armour you can mix and match from to really make your character come to life. And the best part, you can have your own little cute companion like a little baby penguin, a flying kitty, a stupid looking pug or my personal favourite, a little corgi. And the best thing about Reroll, it has a free version with limited character art so you can try before you buy and see if you like it or not. We personally think it's an amazing app that will just improve your overall enjoyment of tabletop role playing games. Reroll is on Apple, Android, Desktop and if you use our coupon code NECKBEARDIA at checkout you get 10% off. It's a great affiliate that we think you guys will love but enough of that, let's get back to the video. I went to each character one by one and started gathering them. By the time I got all five together, we were in one of the many abandoned bars in town. I was behind the bar making drinks for everyone. When I was all done, I stood on the bar. Dirty Schwein have taken things off from us. Back in the 1930s and 40s, we had similar problem. Trouble is, I can't remember who was responsible. Could it have been the Scientologists? The Vietnamese? Commies? Fucking Mormons? I don't know. But whoever has done this to us is going to pay, aren't they? The others were all quite enthusiastic about murdering the cultist. Excellent, meine Freunde. I know what we're up against, and I have some of the means and the will, but I need you. You will be my soldiers, and I your glorious Fuhrer. Together we shall sweep across this cult, crushing all in our path. 
We shall create a world free from this cult of commies for a thousand years. After my inspiring speech, we hotwired three undamaged cars and took them back to our camp. We've also found that on their way out of town, the cultists had resurrected the dead civilians to cover their escape. I think I personally scored a new record in zombie road kills. When we got back to the camp, the kids were all really broken up about the death of Coney. We held a small, tasteful funeral, something that those that fell during a fire and blood would have appreciated. After the funeral preparations were made, we spent a lot of time trying to come up with what to do next. We knew that in order to defeat the cult and its master, this god in the lake, we had to understand it better. Only problem with that was that everything we stole was in the language that none of us could read properly. And the only person that we knew of that was in the state of Montana had been incinerated by... Well, that's not really important, okay? We also couldn't infiltrate the cult because they had to invite people to join their commune, like we were at first. I don't know why I started thinking about it, but I remembered that demon that accidentally summoned. I recalled the way the GM had described it, made it sound exactly like one of the star spawn of Great Cthulhu, which meant that I was invoking the words of Cthulhu. I suddenly realized that there were Cthulhu cults everywhere, and that we could get one of them to read the text. The group looked at me like I was nuts. Why would they help us? And there are no Cthulhu cultists around here, they asked. They will be, because they're going to come here, I said. I felt bad for doing what I was about to do. Even Herr Schnitzel Nazi had limits to the depths of depravity that he was willing to sink to, but I knew there was no other way. We had to make a disturbance big enough for Cthulhu in his ever-dreaming state to notice. We asked one of the other camp counselors to take up the job of reading the eulogy for the PCs that died. Taking a hint from the director's cut of the tales of Old Man Henderson, we set up a projector for the entire camp to say certain lines of prayer along with one another. While they were doing this, we were all extremely far away, and for good reason. All 200 of the kids and camp counselors said those exact summoning words I had said so long ago, bringing in 200 of the Star Spawn Cthulhu to the immediate area. The demons immediately started. God damn it! The demons immediately started massacring everything in sight, and when everyone was dead, they turned on each other. I felt so bad that I did this, even in the game, but it was truly the only way. By the time everything in the camp was good and dead, I lit up a joint in order to commemorate all of the children and friends who died so that the world could be saved. About a week later, we laid low, sticking out some of the surrounding non-obliterated towns, listening for rumors. We of course heard things like, I heard that an entire summer camp was massacred by wild animals, or I heard that some town just got destroyed. Some people say they saw an SS officer there. But eventually we heard a rumor about a large group of strangers was coming around town and asking about the massacre that took place at the summer camp. The plan had worked. Then began phase two of my master genius plan. We had also been preparing the area by making various bombs, smoke grenades, pyrotechnics, and setting up extremely expensive surround sound systems around the gathering area at the camp. When the Cthulhu cultists came to check out the area, we were waiting for them. When the cultists arrived, we set off the smoke bombs, and then started playing Gangnam Style. Our campaign was set in the very specific year of 2012, and was the most annoyingly catchy song that we could think of. Then, with all the cultists all confused, we proceeded to set off explosives and fire traps right there. Additionally, because of the layout of the area, they couldn't really escape out of the bowl of death. According to the GM, right then and there, more than half of the cultists were dead, and the survivors had absolutely no idea what was going on, and were highly disorientated. It was at that moment that the spits were inserted. Jason, Wolf, and I approached them from one half of the bowl of death, and Sergeant Jackson, Josephi, and Tiffany all attacked from the other half. We took exceptional care to leave only one survivor, who was a teenage girl no older than Tiffany. We thought she'd be scared, but the zealous girl immediately pulled out a But the zealous girl immediately pulled out a Glock and started firing on us. Thankfully Wolf came up from behind, disarmed and subdued her. 
Then the interrogation began. I looked the girl dead in the eyes and rolled a critical success on Intimidate. Being so scared that she actually pissed herself, the girl agreed to assist us. She read through all of our papers that we could procure and told us everything that we needed to know. According to her, the god in the lake was not actually physically in the lake. Well, he was, sort of. It was sort of like his spirit was. According to her, the god in the lake is one of the great old ones and came to Earth not long before Great Cthulhu did. The gods did battle, and it resulted in Cthulhu's victory in successively destroying his physical form. But ever since then, the spirit has been trapped in that lake, and has spent so long trying to get out once again. To do so, it needs human cultists. According to the notes written by Director Scott, the head of the cult, they needed human cultists who had become the mindless brethren, for ritualistic and more mindful purposes. The Brethren were actually a sort of larval form of great monsters, which they would one day become. That thing that we saw come out of the lake so long ago was one such greater monster. We also discovered that the gigantic monster that attacked us in the city was what happened when the essence of the god mated with a human female. We thanked the Cthulhu cultists, but decided to keep her with us until our job was complete. We decided we liked her, and wanted a few more adventures with her. And thus ends the pig roast. I will come out with the incident with the boats probably around tomorrow or the next day. Take care my lovely fans and enjoy. We're getting to the end game, baby. Herr Schnitzel Nazi will return. We last left off our story when our heroes captured a teenage girl Cthulhu cultist and learned more about this mysterious god in the lake. And it was one of the few notable events where one of us didn't die. Unfortunately, some 200 children, counselors, and workers at the camp did die though. But to Herr Schnitzel Nazi, their deaths were necessary sacrifices to continue his crusade. At this point, we would spend most of our time trying to devise a ways to kill a god's spirit. Unfortunately, we had a lot of difficulty thinking of any. I believe that it was Jason Knight, the ghost hunter, who came up with the idea. It was essentially, God in the lake. God no leave lake. God need lake to live. We make lake no more. We make God no more. That presented us with another problem, though. How can you kill a fucking lake? Even with all of the firepower Herr Schnitzel Nazi once had, it wasn't enough to actually destroy a lake, let alone a god that lives within it. At this point, the commune cult had become rather desperate to stop us, and had also been expanding their numbers drastically, recruiting from all over the country in an effort to accelerate the resurrection of their god. This presented more problems than the obvious, as cultist attacks have become a fairly normal thing, as well as attacks by what we called Big Brothers. Those are the things that came out of the lake in the first session. Seeing how brethren turn into them eventually, and due to their massive size, we figured that the name was appropriate. Things weren't getting easy at this point, but our activity had another unexpected effect on the state around us. Seeing how we completely obliterated a fairly large town at one point, and how we've continued to wage battles in other populated areas in other sessions, and also how an entire summer camp was completely massacred by unknown creatures, Montana had gone into a sort of state of emergency. That's even one way that the cult was gaining members. They proclaimed to be a safe haven for people to seek refuge at. We tried to curb the reputation with rumors that they're responsible for the destroyed towns, monsters, and magic, but they were just way better at it than we were. We had done a better job at securing a base around the old camp though, had plenty of food, water, and electricity, and had set up monitoring stations and listened and watched TV constantly to pick up on the news. Sergeant Jackson would constantly listen in to military frequencies to learn about their movements. Wolf stags would scout around the area, trying to learn of the cult's doings and watch their progress. Josephi made us some pretty fucking good smoothies. Tiffany would also spend an obscene amount of time on Tinder trying to get rebound sex to make up for the pain of her murdered boyfriend and parents. 
Still completely unaware that I was partially responsible. And Jason Knight used his TV show to try and promote conspiracy theories about the commune. We were despairing at this point. We couldn't figure out what to do. And at this point, we almost thought that the cult could win. But then, Sergeant Jackson heard over one of the military frequencies that all of the freaky stuff that's been going on in the state, the military is planning on relocating some of the nuclear weapons to more safe locations. That's when we got the idea on how we were going to obliterate the lake. When I told the others about this, they were for some reason apprehensive about the idea of setting off a thermonuclear device. They also pointed out that if we do steal it, then the entire might of the United States military was going to be on our asses in seconds. We'd probably end up getting our own satellite. I convinced them by saying that it was our only chance for revenge, because at this point, our only option were to run away and do nothing while the god in the lake rises to kill us all. Or sit on our asses here and have them kill us before the god in the lake rises. Not long after, the others were in business, and we had our plan already. The nuclear weapon was being transported down a fairly major river in order to make it to a railway, and was under exceptionally heavy guard. We could never catch up to it near a railroad, so we figured our only chance was to get it at the river. We also didn't need the entire missile. We only needed the warhead, which would be rather difficult to get, but it would be much easier than moving an entire missile. Pooling our funds together, we managed to buy an extremely high quality speedboat, which we rowed out into the scheduled river three days before the move was scheduled to happen. We stayed on the boat and hid it in the brush near the riverbank, just deep enough for us to start up quickly. When the boat arrived, we finally understood the definition of what the U.S. military meant when it said, under heavy guard. There were several Apache attack helicopters flying overhead. Tanks and Humvees patrolled along the road next to the river, and at least six patrol boats armed with miniguns and missile launchers escorted the large vessel used to transport the missile itself, and we counted dozens of guards on board the ship itself. All this, and whoever knows what other deterrents our GM might have come up with. Things were not exactly looking up for us at this point. We decided that going all pirate on the boat was not exactly an option for us at this point. That's when we decided to go with plan B. We decided to abandon our super expensive speedboat in favor of something else. The boat was moving at night, which made this far easier than it could have been. We all got out one of those scuba jets, which would allow us to get up to the boat in time. Wolf and Sergeant Jackson went for one of the patrol boats and killed the crew on board. Meanwhile, Tiffany, Jason, Josephi, and I all scaled up the side of the boat and started sneaking our way through. Josephi had a lot of experience with engines and went out to disable their engine, hoping to move attention away from the cargo. This worked as the guy rolled a critical in his attempt making it look perfectly like an accident. While the crew was busy with this, I led the others to the direction of the missile. Josephi was invaluable here and did a perfect job of getting out the warhead without spilling a shit ton of radiation to kill us. Tiffany's phone, however, went off during one of her stealth rolls, which alerted the guards to our whereabouts. I shot and killed the guards, but apparently gunshots are extremely loud. More guards arrived and we got into a massive shootout. Military personnel are also far better at fighting than cultists are, and we found ourselves getting overwhelmed. Having prepared for this, I attached a 15 pound block of C4 to the wall behind us, and we all took cover. After throwing a smoke bomb and three stick grenades into the room, covering our escape and killing a few marines in the process, the four of us ran out of the hole I had made. Josephi, Tiffany, and Jason were all pretty badly injured during the fight, but I had somehow managed to evade getting hit. I personally apply that to Herr Schnitzel Nazi's uncommonly high dexterity score. We ran along the edges of the ship. I pulled a Henderson and Judo kicked a guard who tried to take us prisoner off the ship. Thank you again, dexterity. The others jumped off the ship, but before I could... I found nearly all of the ship's guards right behind me. 
I raised my two middle fingers and said, Sig hail, motherfuckers, and then slipped over the edge, losing only three hit points in the process. The other patrol boats and helicopters were searching furiously for us in the water, but we stealthily made our way over to the patrol boat which Jackson and Wolf had procured. Getting ready to distract the military, we detonated some charges that we had placed on our fancy speedboat, which immediately ugh, drew the attention of every helicopter and boat in the river, which allowed us to escape with our nuclear warhead completely unmolested. The military also didn't go looking for the boat because they just assumed that it went out to secure the river. In actuality, we learned via Google Maps that the river we were in was connected to the lake. Damned convenient. Tiffany watched the news on her phone and they reported that our nuclear warhead was stolen. But the terrorists who stole it were all most likely killed when their boat caught fire and exploded. We doubted the military really believed that, but were just trying to get people not to panic. We made our way back to the lake not long later. It was a good time, but we had to figure out a way to detonate a warhead, but that could be done later. Maybe we could kidnap a nuclear scientist or something. That's when the cultists showed up. Oh yeah, you thought the incident with the boats was all over, didn't you? The cult had heard about what happened and immediately suspected us and prepared an ambush. A dozen speedboats that the cult apparently owned came out of nowhere. Their guys armed with their assault rifles, some heavy machine guns, and even a few rocket launchers. To make matters worse, we also noticed some of the brethren swimming around in the water, attempting to climb on board our ship, as well as other Eldritic horrors beneath the waves. The cultists got the drop on us and damaged the ship. Unfortunately for them, it was equipped with mini guns and missile launchers, which helped us damage their numbers. But even when we hit back with those, the cult hit back again. They used some of their magic to curse our ship, making things break and jam and other unfortunate things happen to us. Wolf was hit with a lucky shot by one of the cultists and went down to die. Even me with all of my medical knowledge couldn't save him. Things were hard, but after all of us being pretty badly injured, we managed to wipe out the last of the cultists. That's when I decided to give the cult another fuck you moment. I dropped off the others at the shore by the camp. That's when I wired every missile in round on board the boat to go up. Then I started the boat up and jammed it into maximum acceleration on direct course for the commune. Herr Schnitzel Nazi jumped off the boat not long after starting it and swam to shore. We then watched as the boat, moving at surprisingly fast speed, ram ashore by the commune and immediately blow up, giving us an explosion that we could see clearly all the way across the massive lake. Adventures of Herr Schnitzel Nazi Killing the Gods So here were everyone, the end game. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is brought to you by Neckbeardia's 3D printed models. Go ahead and check out the eBay store down below. We have tons and tons of really cool looking models. We've got it all from orcs, dwarves, the lizards and fish people. And yes, most of the sets you can get some big bitty bitches in with them. <laughs> and honestly, they're our biggest sellers. Yeah, by far. Yeah. All the models are printed and processed by us, and it is by far the best way to help us out to do what we do. So go ahead and check them out below, and just just look at this lizard lady with titties. She got <laughs> Look at the titties! <laughs> These were the final days of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, and I knew it. I think that the GM just wanted Herr Schnitzel Nazi to die, just in order to prove that he could actually do it. He thought that this character's strength came from his obscenely large arsenal of weapons, so he took my car, and that backfired on him. He tried to do everything in his power to kill my character, and that backfired on my entire party, but in this session, I knew that the GM wouldn't let Herr Schnitzel Nazi live. Don't get me wrong, I completely understand. Like I said, I DM slash GM myself. So I knew of his struggles. I even honestly wanted Herr Schnitzel Nazi to die, I think. 
But I knew that if he was going to go, it would be in the best way imaginable. And I'd be damned if that fucking god in the lake made it out of this too. The few sessions in between the incident with the boats and killing the gods were spent trying to figure out how to detonate the warhead in order to destroy the lake. In that time, we kidnapped a nuclear scientist, adding to our other prisoner, the female cultist of Cthulhu, who we learned at that point was named Jade. Actually, an interesting development happened there. The girl who played Tiffany the teenage girl IRL discovered that she was bisexual in those few sessions. I think Gal Gadot had something to do with her sexual awakening. Becoming excited by this, she decided to roleplay that Tiffany, still in grief over the loss of her boyfriend and family, discovered this, and decided to take comfort in the arms of the beautiful Jade. Herr Schnitzel Nazi deeply approved of this relationship, as I knew out of game that Nazis actually did a lot to advance women's rights, and despite being arduously opposed to male homosexuality, they were surprisingly lenient when it came to lesbianism. Because it's hot. That's why. <laughs> but besides, Herr Schnitzel Nazi would be damned if he didn't have the girl's best interest in mind. Going back to those few sessions, the commune and the god in the lake knew exactly what we were doing and started to throw every single thing they had at us. This got so bad that it actually forced us to move bases and even killed Josephi the smoothie maker in the process. We gave him a small funeral, something he'd enjoy. Pour out a smoothie for our homie Josephi boys. <laughs> Pour out a smoothie. The president's girlfriend, who if you're forgetting was Josephi's player, decided that she wanted to get back to her roots. So she made a new character, Buck the Bruck, who was the twin brother of her first character, Chuck the Chunk. He was basically the same character but with a different name. She also decided to take advantage of the backstory reliant nature of Call of Cthulhu and said that Buck was one of an undisclosed numbers of siblings of Chuck allowing her to justify bringing the same character back every time that one would die. There was also the next character for Wolf Stags, Survival Master. Wolf's next character was a heavily armed spec ops operative named Victor Armstrong, who was trying to remain low for a while. Got bored, and then decided to just stick around with our group. We didn't complain. The hilarious thing about this character was how his player roleplayed him with so few fucks to give. I don't know how a human could not care about anything as much as Victor was roleplayed to. It was quite hilarious. The story begins with us in our new base on top of a small mountain, overlooking thousands of acres of forest as well as the lake which held our great Eldritch foe. Jason Knight, Ghost Hunter, was editing his footage that he had taken during our last session in an attempt to document our story and also get famous. Buck the Bruck was cleaning his shotgun and keeping watch for any of the bad people, yes? I believe was how he put it. Victor was setting up a perimeter and getting high on some of the weed that Herr Schnitzel Nazi had stolen off Buddy, the camp counselor. Sergeant Jackson was still keeping watch while also cleaning weapons and readying some homemade explosives. Meanwhile, Tiffany was off somewhere having sex with Jade. Lesbians. Every great story has to have lesbians, am I right? I know Tiffany and her player are bi. Yes, we know they're bi. Thank you. While they were doing this, I was guarding the nuclear scientist that we kidnapped and was making sure that he was working. I wasn't being a dick about it, barely even took it seriously. I smoked a bit of weed from a joint the size of a baby's arm and even offered him a hit or two. He took it and definitely mellowed out a bit. The first exciting incident was when our nuclear warhead was finally ready to be detonated remotely. Well, when I say ready, I meant that our warhead was so scantily designed that the GM only gave it a 50% chance of actually working. Our scientist was working with very limited material after all, and so we had to just throw together something that could potentially work for us. We didn't really mind though, it seemed to fit the motif of our party. We decided to celebrate this by having a bit of a feast. 
Soon it would all be over, our characters knew, and we finally have our revenge for what those bastards did to each and every one of us. Mostly me and the destruction of my precious car, though. Pinto cruising wagons don't grow on trees, you know, and neither do Nazi weapons, Nazi gold, and the actual copy of the Mona Lisa. That night, in the midst of our feast, the GM described us seeing the lake with the god in it suddenly glowing a foul green color, so bright that it reaches clear to the sky. Not long after all of us started staring at the lake, we all collapsed in immense pain. A ghostly voice started whispering in our ears, a voice so horrible and great that it began to tear at the very fabric of our minds. And yet, no matter how much it tore at us, or how much pain we were in, we could not help but listen and understand it. The voice said something different to each of us, each having to do with something personal and intimate to us. It started mocking, taunting, and intimidating us. And I knew it was Voldemort in the flesh. You're, you're a wizard, Schnitzel. Succeeding on my sanity check, I began to resist the will of the god in my mind. I instead picked myself off the ground. I was still in immense pain and I could still hear the voice perfectly well, but I was now able to actually somewhat think and perform actions unlike the others. I then looked right at the lake, still hearing the horrible voice of the god in my head. Then Herr Schnitzel Nazi zipped down his pants and underwear and began to vigorously masturbate while proceeding to proudly bell while proceeding to proudly bellow the German national anthem which I'd actually memorized out of character. Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber alles, I shouted with great pride. No Eldrick god could ever get in between Herr Schnitzel Nazi and his sacred duty to the Third Reich, as well as the rise of the Fourth. Über alles in der Welt, wenn ist es zu schutz und Truitze. Eventually, with my inspiring words, the pain in the voice began to recede, as did the color within the lake as well. The others lost a bit of sanity, but were for the most part fine. This attack on our minds only solidified our resolve to rid the world of this fucking god. That bitch was going to suffer. We all knew it. After that incident, and also after finishing masturbating, just everyone's like, like got their backs turned politely here and is like, just <laughs> slap a flesh as he's fucking trying to finish. Ah, fuck me. Herr Schnitzel Nazi asked Tiffany if he could talk to Jade the Cultist for a little while. We went off together and I asked her what she knew of the essence of the gods, like the one that was in the lake. It was pretty easy to convince her to tell me, as she at this point thought that I was only going after that god who was an enemy of Cthulhu. Jade was a relatively high-ranking sister of the cult, but after she told me that as far as what the sacred text said, the power and essence of the god is an unknowable force. Deciding that it wasn't worth looking further into with her, I asked the GM if I could make an occult roll. I had a skill of about 60% with that, and I was hoping to see if I could know anything else about our elderic foes. Through sheer luck, I managed to roll a critical success on this, and the GM told me that I basically knew everything about the Eldritch Gods. He also sent me all the information that he had on the Outer Gods and Great Old Ones within the HP Lovecraft Mythos. While everyone else was planning how we were going to set our operation into motion, I was reading thoroughly through the information the GM sent me. I had the inklings of an idea but I wanted to know if it could possibly work. Early the next morning b began rather thrilling. That's, that's not even a fucking, what's this? This is a nothing sentence. What is this? <sighs> Jesus. Turns out that the US military had found us in our little hiding place, likely getting tipped off by that fucking cult. Black Hawk and Apache attack helicopters swarmed around us, and Spec Ops troops repelled out of their helicopters. We had planned on this happening, though, and set off dozens upon dozens of smoke grenades. When the troopers went in anyways, we set off all of our homemade explosives around us, killing, injuring, incapacitating, or confusing our enemies. 
Meanwhile, we wasted no time gathering everything that we would need and storing it in our cars. Not long before the smoke would clear, we gunned the engines and started driving right down the side of the mountain. I have no idea how we passed our drive automobile checks on that, but by some miracle we did. Herr Schnitzel Nazi thanked the Fuhrer when he and his compatriots reached the designated area, a few miles away. The Apache helicopters hot on our tails. Fortunately, the dense foliage gave us cover. Thus, when we enacted stage three of our master escape plan. We jammed the accelerators by sticking knives through them and wired gas explosives to the airbags. After crashing them into trees and having them blow up, the military would think that we crashed. Just to buy ourselves a little more time before we did this, we had corpses from the cultists, one for each of us, put inside the cars as body doubles. Herr Schnitzel Nazi also used his vast medicinal knowledge to confuse the morticians into thinking that they would have died in the crash. After we did all of this, we fled on foot. Thankfully, my GM didn't know that most attack helicopters have heat, ultraviolet, and motion sensors on them. I was just thinking that, like, they could track you via thermals. You know? <laughs> Stairs and hungry Apache chain gun. <laughs> like, you wouldn't make it far at all, brother. <laughs> we managed to make our way back to the old summer camp, with the military distracted by our cars. We set up a stronghold inside the lodging area for the camp counselors, and were prepared to retreat into the caverns underneath the bathroom if we had to. After a short breather, we decided that our only hope was to act quickly on the cult. We made some slight modifications to the plan to suit our new circumstances, but were sure that it would work. It was also around this time when I had actually found the tiny pieces of information that I needed in order for my secret plan to work. I smiled when I read this, and I swear that tear of joy actually rolled down my cheek. That night, before our operation, I sat everyone around for one final supper. I asked each of them to take of my weed, and we each smoke a last joint together. After finishing up the last of that dank-ass kush, I told everyone that there would be no more lucky rolls, no more sly moves from me, and no more tricks up my sleeves. Herr Schnitzel Nazi was going to die tonight. They all told me that it wouldn't happen, and that I'd make it through this, but I silenced them so I could finish my Jesus and <laughs> my Jesus analogy. <laughs> Allegorical Jesus Nazi. It's a thing now. I told them that it was unavoidable. Herr Schnitzel Nazi had lived for 92 years. He was an old man and was ready for it all to end. But in the end, he would die saving the world. He was happy, happy to die with a true purpose once again. But most of all, he was happy to die among not just his brothers and sisters in arms, but the only family that he can remember himself ever having. Herr Schnitzel Nazi led the charge down into the caverns beneath the camp. We were all in full battle gear, wearing full riot gear, military grade bulletproof vests, and carrying the best weapons that we could have in the game. Except me. I still insisted on my Nazi era weapons. All things we had stolen. We walked down the caverns, gleaming like knights of old ready for battle. Even the scientist and Jade the cultist, spurred on by the righteousness of our cause, decided to fight with us. Although I think Jade was also influenced by Tiffany. Tiffany's fine ass. Our plan was simple. Murder any of the nasties we find in our way, and get that nuclear warhead to that cistern in the center of the lake. Then, we'd hopefully escape to a safe distance and detonate the bomb. But we were all ready to detonate it immediately after setting it up if it meant stopping the cult. The first things that we came across were a horde of Shogoth, which blocked our pathway ahead. They came swiftly for us and we opened fire with our assault rifles. That seemed to slow their advance, but then again it wasn't really meant to kill them. Only to buy time for Tiffany to get out a grenade launcher and load incendiary grenades in it. Within a few seconds, all that was left in the pathway were us and the smell of burning Shogoth. We continued our advance, killing wave after wave of cultists, zombies, brethren, and other elder horrors which crossed our path. We could keep slaughtering them, but slowly the battles were taking a toll on our sanity and health. 
Eventually, we managed to reach the cistern in the middle of the lake, most of us with only half our health and sanity left. The cistern was oddly quiet. There seemed to be nothing around us. It was clearly an ambush, but we couldn't waste time on sitting on our asses. Our group made its way to the center of the room, right by where the Shogoth was in our little tentacle porn incident, if you recall. The nuclear scientist got to work arming the bomb and detonator immediately. Ugh. When he got started on this, coming out of each of the entrances surrounding the cistern came a big brother. You remember those things, like the bastard which came out of the lake in our first session and forced us to turn Chuck the Chunk into a suicide bomber. We managed to avoid their mental attacks and began to fire upon them, as well as use up large proportions of our grenades, both of those thrown and fired out of the grenade launcher. It was when we killed about half of them that we began to feel as though we could actually win this fight. That is until dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds, of zombies, brethren, and cultists began to pour out of all the other entrances into the cistern. We fought for our lives, but were quickly losing ground. Half of us were already dead by the time our scientist buddy, who I refuse to this day to know the name of, had finished setting up the bomb and detonator. He turned to face me and handed it right to me. Don't worry, Herr Schnitzel Nazi. We'll take them all out with us, and our deaths will be quicker than the blink of an eye, he says to me. Herr Schnitzel Nazi knew of sacrifice, better than most in fact. He understood what he had to do, but it was hard for him. They were family to him. Yeah, yeah, Herr Schnitzel Nazi might have been a crazy former Nazi who can't even remember his days before he met Adolf, but his crusade to destroy the cult and those who fought along with him and were prepared to risk everything with him had given him purpose once again. They were the only people left alive who cared about him. And he cared about them as well as everyone else apart from the commies and Scientologists, but that's not important. That's what made what I was going to do next all the harder. Herr Schnitzel Nazi pulled out his Luger and executed the nuclear scientists right before him. He then proceeded to gun down all of his remaining friends, one by one. In real life, all of the others in the party turned to me with expressions of, what the fuck dude, and why did you do that, on their faces. Without even acknowledging them, I turned to the GM. Herr Schnitzel Nazi invokes the power of the Outer Gods. I call upon them to unveil the essences of the Great Old Ones before me. The GM looked through his notes, clearly not expecting what had just happened. I told him that in order for one to perform the ritual that I just did, they would have to sacrifice those left alive who were closest to them. I had done just that, and I wanted to travel to a very specific part of reality. Everyone looked confused, and that's why I threw out the information that was part of my master plan. You see, all of the greater old ones, the outer gods, don't exactly keep all of their power within them. It's extremely hard to explain. I mean, it's so hard that even the book I was reading barely goes into it. But what it basically means is that what gives the great old ones their power, all of that is tied to one very distinct place within time and space. A place that can only be accessed through an exceptionally dark and evil ritual. A ritual that I had just performed. A ritual that was taking me and my nuclear weapon right there. Killing this single great old one wasn't enough. If I were to do this, it would make every single great old one and outer god about as harmless as a crippled mouse because they literally had no more power to draw upon. The GM told me that there is a blinding flash of light before everything around me goes dark. That's when I wake up in an area so indescribably beautiful that I can hardly conceive of it. The GM told me that the only possible way that he could describe it would be that it looked like I was in the middle of a nebula. Google it if you don't know what it looks like, it's really quite beautiful. I can see my nuclear warhead right next to me, and the detonator the scientist gave me was in my hand. I was ready to push it, but before I could, the GM still had one ace up his sleeve. This was an ace that I didn't even see coming. I know that I've mentioned it earlier, but I really have to again. My GM is truly a fantastic one. 
He has an incredible grasp on good storytelling and how to create excitement and intrigue, as well as exceptionally complex plots. But his real strength comes from his understanding of characterization. He knows characters both in games and out. He knows me, and he knows that I'm a slave to role-playing, and he knew Herr Schnitzel Nazi's one weakness, one that even I didn't fully understand myself. The GM tells me that the voice of the god in the lake speaks to me directly, and in doing so it takes something from me. It calls upon its power to do something to me that would destroy my character without even touching him. The GM took away Herr Schnitzel Nazi's insanity. Now, I'm sure you've never heard of an eldritch god curing insanity within a game of Call of Cthulhu, but then again, this game that we played was rather original. Everything you thought you knew was a lie, the voice of the god in the lake said to me. You are nothing. Even the reality that you thought you had a grasp on was an enormous falsehood. According to the GM, everything about me that I once knew and had forgotten or suppressed was flooding back to me so fast that my mind could barely contain it. I remembered everything. My real name. The fact that I only pretended to believe in Nazi ideology. Who the Nazis hated. What I did before the war. The fact that I was actually an American. And moreover, the fact that I'm actually black. The GM's plan right there was actually just to make me sane once again, and rule that the flooding of memories and the complete shattering of everything that I thought I knew and believed in would destroy my mind completely, and thus leave me incapable of detonating the nuclear weapon, and I'd be left to drift aimlessly through the eternal nothingness of this plane, with my mind completely and utterly destroyed. Not the best ending to a story. Now, I won't get into the actual roles and total success I had encountering this, because frankly, the end story explanation is way more interesting and dramatic. According to the GM, I grasped onto my friends. Those that I had to kill in order to come here. If I failed them, then they'd have died for nothing. Herr Schnitzel Nazi was able to grasp on something he knew that was real. His friends and his care for them was real, not just part of his insanity. He smiled and wiped the tears from his eyes, as he knew that he'd soon be with them. Herr Schnitzel Nazi didn't care that everything he knew was a lie, and he didn't care that nothing would really matter in the end. Because for the briefest time that he spent with his friends, after the fire and blood incident, he found purpose again, and he found care for them. Even if they had to die, he knew that the feelings he had for them were all completely real. And that was it. I had one, and I hadn't even pulled the trigger on the detonator yet. The GM was out of tricks, and Herr Schnitzel Nazi had bested him. I could hear the thoughts and pleas of all the gods and great old ones. I could hear their pleas, practically begging me not to do this to them. Herr Schnitzel Nazi pulled out a blunt from his SS coat pocket and lit it up. He took a long drag, getting it down about halfway. After blowing it out, he spoke, still insisting on using his German accent. I got something to say to you guys, he asked all of the Eldritch Gods. You call us worms and pathetic, and you think us so small. Eh, to be fair, we totally are. You're just so great, and could squash us like bugs without a second thought. But when me and my friends were faced with our ends, we didn't even blink. But all you bitches did. The gods were silent as Herr Schnitzel Nazi finished up the last weed he would ever smoke again. I had to sacrifice a lot to get this far. And even then, you took something away from me. Now I'm going to take something away from you. With only a second's hesitation, I pulled the trigger on the detonator, and it succeeded in going off. The GM didn't even bother making us roll for it. According to him, the bomb goes off and annihilates the plane and everything within it. All of the gods and the old great ones are rendered completely powerless and are incapable of doing anything apart from just existing. Killing one god who fucked me over wasn't enough. I didn't want to just kill the gods in the lake. I wanted to make him suffer. Make him just sit and watch helpless to the world around him. 
incapable of anything. A fate like that just seemed oh so much more satisfying to me. The fact that it would also destroy every other fucking god and whatever only made it just so much sweeter. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a tale of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, the man who killed the gods. And that is the final story to the tale of Herr Schnitzel Nazi. I hope you all enjoyed. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. But if you like even more original stories, stop on by Guard Beardy, where I'm writing up two original stories. And like a farmer's garden is from my hands to your ears, no middleman required. So stop on by and give a listen. But until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bro.